Hello and welcome to episode 55 of Handgun Radio. I'm your host, Ryan Machad, from the wild woods of central Maine, and this is your home for all the news, information, and discussion in the handgunning world. This week, I'm joined by Grant Cunningham, the proprietor of the Personal Security Institute, and Paul Carlson, the proprietor of Safety Solutions Academy, to discuss a recent training class they held together and to get their perspectives of the trainer and trainee when it comes to defensive handgun training. So, as always, Handgun Radio is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network, and Brownells helps make Handgun Radio possible. Selection, service, and satisfaction. Find it all at Brownells. If you're doing any shopping with Brownells, please use our affiliate link, handgunradio.com slash Brownells, to help support the show. So how are you guys doing this week? Terrific. Glad to be here. Excellent. Glad to have you back, Grant. And Paul, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. I've had a great couple of weeks and, uh, and equally excited to spend some time with you tonight. Really appreciate you guys coming on and uh, kind of getting a little bit of perspective from both sides of the equation when it comes to training. So we're going to uh, skip the week in review. We're just going to head right into the main topic because we have two uh, very experienced guests here who can shed some light on defensive handgun training, the trainer and trainee perspectives. So earlier this month, Grant held a defensive revolver fundamentals training course with Paul Carlson at Safety Solutions Academy in Ohio. Uh, Paul hosted Grant, but also took part as a trainee in the course, and we have both gentlemen here with us tonight to discuss the different perspectives and what they've learned that will help get you, help you get the most out of your defensive firearms training. So, uh, Grant, basically, do you um, you offer a different set of services, um, auto pistol, revolver, and then go to different training academies like this usually? Yeah, what happens is I usually get invited to to some place around the country to teach, and in this particular p- case, Paul was kind enough to invite me out to Ohio to hold a a class at his uh, academy, and it, he of course got the chance to become a student during that time too. So around the country, sometimes it'll be a a range that will that will bring me out for the benefit of its members. Sometimes it'll be a, a another training company like Paul's that will do it. And sometimes a bunch of guys will just get together and bring me out to teach a class. So usually I don't get the I don't get the advantage of having another instructor uh, on the line as a student and get feedback that way, and, it was, and it's incredibly valuable for me as a teacher to get that kind of feedback. So that's uh, that's the kind of thing that I don't usually get. No, like what are some of the common, most common misconceptions that people have when they first show up at a training course? I think I think one of them is that that there is some secret that you're going to show them. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, realistically, and and even things that that I'm teaching, there's really nothing secret. Uh, and as uh, Paul can can tell you, the even the stuff that the stuff that I taught at this particular course, which went a little beyond the stuff that that he's seen before, is still stuff that goes back uh, decades, a couple of decades at least. Mm-hmm. And so the I think a lot of people go to a class and they think, gosh, they're going to learn some secret ninja, warrior, something or other that's going to allow me to defeat all the terrorists in the world. Um, that there is some secret spetsnaz or you know special forces thing that, that you're going to teach them, and there just really isn't. But that sort of belief persists, and quite frankly, a lot of people use it to sell a lot of courses. And so that idea that there is some secret ninja technique you're going to show them persists unfortunately. I, I think that's interesting how you approach that Grant and, and I tend to agree with you. There's there's very little that's happening in the firearms community that truly is original. What there is however that can be really beneficial to students that they may not understand is that the same material might be presented in a different way that happens to connect with with student X better than when they learned it from instructor A, B, or C, or their husband or their wife, or, you know, the the local guy at the range that had something to share, if that makes sense. Um, Different instructors have different abilities to communicate, to connect with different people, and I think people have the misconception that if they've gone to a training course, whether it's their concealed carry course, 
or any other course, they have this conception that, oh, I'm tra trained now. And, uh, you know, on multiple occasions, I've spent the weekend as a student or as an instructor or as a co-instructor where I've watched highly trained individuals, meaning multiple courses, have some kind of a breakthrough or some kind of a revelation because they heard something in a different way or executed a skill in a new way that worked better for them. And I think one of the misconceptions that people have is, is that I've taken a training course, now I'm all set. This is a progressive uh, endeavor, and, and that's really what it comes down to for me. Well, and the thing is, you know, you have people who are who have taken like a, a concealed carry course that basically just, you know, says here's the basics of how to be safe with a firearm, here's the laws in our particular state, yet they don't know that there's more beyond that, and it is a perishable skill. You can't just take one course ten years ago and then expect that to carry you on your entire life. You need to keep at it, like you said, Paul. Absolutely, and, and you know, today, Ryan, out at the range, I, I was working with another instructor. We had Daniel Shaw in town uh, this week uh, teaching his Handgun Vitals 1 and 2 course. He's with Thunderbird Tactical these days in Wichita, Kansas. Great instructor. On the range next to us, way away where people couldn't even see where we were, what we were doing, there were, I don't know, 110 people that were going through a concealed carry course. Yes, you heard that, 110 people. Wow. And what those people don't realize is, is there's so much more beyond that. And we can consider that a misconception. Uh, the misconception that that the concealed carry course is really training. And really what that is is a check-the-box administrative bureaucratic uh, necessity in the state of Ohio and in many other states. And, and people have this misconception that that is the end-all, be-all. And it's an unfortunate misconception. You know, one of the the words that I talk about quite a bit in my classes is the word context. And I think it's an, an incredibly valuable word when we talk about defensive handgunning, and that is that when we when we sort of look at if we back out and look at the macro view of the entire shooting world, there are all kinds of things that we can do with a gun that aren't necessarily related. And we talk about things like uh, competition shooting and target shooting and hunting and plinking and, and, and defensive shooting. And all of those things have their own set of of techniques and procedures and concepts and understandings that work for that particular context. And those same techniques and, and procedures and all that other stuff applied to a different area of, of firearms use may not fit. And we talk very much about the, the difference between, for instance, the, the perspective of law enforcement and the perspective of competition shooting as it affects defensive handgunning. And sometimes the what fits in one context doesn't fit in another. So what you'll very often have are people who go out and say, well, either A, I've taken my concealed carry course, that's a, that's a common one, or my uncle was in the Marines and he taught me to shoot, so I... You know, I know everything I need to know about mm -hmm. shooting, or my, uh, or my dad's best friend was a was a cop, and or something like that. And the the lack of understanding of this idea of context that things don't necessarily fit just because you happen to be using a firearm doing it, even. It, and I tell people it's like the difference between driving in the Indy 500 and driving to work. The only thing that's the same between those two activities is that your vehicle has four tires and a steering wheel. Other than that, everything else is different, and of course all the things that you do relative the, to those two activities is different. The context is different between them, so you wouldn't use the same sorts of skills that you do driving in the Indy 500 or driving in a drag race that you do driving to work in the morning. And sometimes that gets through to people, sometimes it doesn't, but there's still that idea that all shooting is shooting, and if I've done it once because somebody was, you know, whatever authority figure you want to use, then I know everything I need to know. And of course that's just not true. Well, and the thing, too, that you notice is not only are you guys trying to give people the knowledge they need to be proficient with their firearms, but you're also trying to negate all the, the bad things that people have been told, you know, from a friend's friend's brother or whatever. I mean, I know uh, one telling moment was in my concealed carry class here uh, 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 where the instructor stood up and he said, so how many of you have heard the story, if you shoot somebody, make sure you drag them in the front door before you call the cops? And probably four or five people raised their hand. Clearly, they weren't shooters. This was a course that they were just taking. They were beginners. 
and he said, I can't believe that you guys, that's absolutely wrong, but I've heard that over and over again, and it's absolutely incorrect, but it's just amazing how much bad information can be disseminated among so many people. Absolutely. There's there's really no doubt about that, Ryan, and, and we hear these cliches, you know, I'd rather be judged by 12 than carried by 6, kill them all, let God sort them out, and all these kinds of things that maybe in some context, Grant used that word, and it's a very appropriate word, have some kind of meaning that makes sense, and we just blanket apply them um, to what it is that we do, and, and that's an unfortunate thing to do. We need to, to really think about our philosophy when it comes to personal protection, self-defense, concealed carry, and you know, abiding by some rule that you know your gun is supposed to be comforting, not comfortable, <laughs> doesn't necessarily lead you in the right direction. And and that's one of the you know that those the, the adherence to these cliches is a misconception I see from students, and that's unfortunate. Unfortunately, a lot of what goes on in this industry is teaching by cliche or teaching mm -hmm. by sound soundbite, and so you get a lot of these pithy sayings. And I, I, I spend a, sometimes a lot of time sort of knocking these things down and, and showing the the lack of logic or the illogical uh, components of some of these uh, sayings, and yet you hear them over and over and over again. I don't. Luckily, I think the the internet I think has been actually sort of valuable in this. There are some of them that I don't hear as much as I used to, mm -hmm. and thankfully. Uh, for that, so I think some information is is getting out there more, but there's still enough of them, and there's still enough uh, in instructors in the industry out there using some of these totally nonsensical sayings. And I I do spend some time. I know Paul spends uh, some time trying to knock those down and trying to replace those with you know logic and fact and evidence and all that sort of thing. Two of the things that I mainly try to say to anybody, I'm, I'm obviously not a trainer in the caliber of your guys, but I I say two things mainly uh, to new concealed carriers. One, everybody who was accidentally shot was shot by an unloaded gun, and some people don't get that. And two, if you think carrying a firearm makes you invincible and 10 feet tall, you're carrying a firearm for the wrong reasons. Yeah, I think that and sometimes there are some of us uh, in, in the industry who sometimes perpetuate, especially that second one particularly, mm -hmm. perpetuate that a little bit. And and I think that this has been sort of something that I've been working on for a while now and pointing out that, you know, the, the, the gun certainly doesn't make you invisible. It's also not the be-all, end-all tool. And what I mean by that is that the firearm is an incredibly efficient, effective way to deal with a very, very narrow subset of interactions that we have in our lives. It's very much, uh, the analogy to a fire extinguisher is actually very apt, except for the fact that you'll need a fire extinguisher probably more often than you'll need a gun in your life. But the the analogy is actually very apt. It's, it's a tool applicable to a very, very narrow range of happenings. And I think that sometimes in the defensive shooting world that we don't acknowledge that so much. And as a result, we don't pay attention to things like hand-to-hand -hand skills. And we also don't sort of jump back and look at the bigger picture, which is survival in, in its broader sense. And we don't talk about things like, like how to deal with massive trauma, which you're an order of magnitude more likely to need to know how to do than shoot your gun. Um, so the idea that that the gun is, is makes you invincible comes from that idea that the gun is is just the most important thing you can possibly have in your life, and uh, and it's just not true. And I, f I find myself a lot of time a lot of the writing that I'm doing lately works on that angle to say you know guys listen yeah it's an important tool it's a very efficient tool but we also have to remember there are other things in the world too and we should probably pay a little bit of attention to those. And I think that's really important Grant how it is that you frame that and one of the things that concerns me is that the firearm has really gone the American way if you will in that it seems to be what people choose as the easy solution the magic bullet yeah. 
And whether it's dieting or uh, you know becoming physically fit or making money on the internet, or everyone's always searching for the secret tool that can handle everything. And when we're talking about our personal safety, the safety of our loved ones, uh, it's not a magic bullet. There is no magic bullet. And we have to have that those well-rounded skills. And so searching for that magic bullet is is unfortunately a futile effort that's just a waste of energy. And Grant points that out expertly in, in talking about the idea that you have to have other skills. It's one little piece of a very large puzzle. Well, and you can compare and contrast a couple examples from recent uh, recent times. You had the uh, the concealed carrier in the Walmart out in Las Vegas who unfortunately was killed um, trying to intervene, and we still don't have all the details to that. And the same can be tr said with the, the Pennsylvania shooting just this last week, which are, the details are still kind of murky, but, you know, people still lost their lives and the doctor still was wounded, and he, from what I understand, shot the guy three times. And the guy, you know, it wasn't like in the movies you got the one shot, stop, the guy's down, that's it. You know, he was still able to wound the doctor. Yes, he did stop it, but... But you see the, the difference between those two with the doctor. Yeah, he had a gun, but and he stopped it. But it was not like the end-all, be-all. It did not completely make it everybody invincible like you the movies would make you believe. Absolutely. Definitely. So uh, kind of moving on here, um, how specifically do you guys structure your training time? Do you place more value or emphasis on the, the classroom time as opposed to range time? Or do you prefer to have an equal amount of both? <laughs> I, I'm going through sort of a, a, a an evolution in in this area. I I have historically spent a lot of lecture time, and uh, you know basically my my theory has always been to to lay the the philosophical and conceptual framework down and allow the student to fit in all of the physical skills that we that we teach in the in you know most of the rest of the class and allow them to plug those skills into that conceptual framework mm -hmm. and uh, i i'm starting to get away from that i i mean i've done uh, two hour sometimes two hour lectures at the beginning of class and i i'm getting away from that and giving the the students hopefully a very very basic framework of what's going to go on with some some with only those concepts and theories that are absolutely necessary for them to understand what's what's going to happen and then as i i get out on the range and work on the range to bring in the other concepts things that i might have originally covered in lecture and do those on the spot as they apply to whatever skill or whatever lesson we're studying. So I, I'm changing a little bit there. I, in the past, I've done a lot more lecture time. In the future, I'm going to do less lecture time at, at the start of class. There will still be a lot of lecture, but it'll be broken up you know, uh, in the moment as needed um, more immediately than uh, that I can typically get in a in a lecture situation. Yeah, I, I think Grant and I have a very similar philosophy, and I'm just going to explain this from a, a little bit different viewpoint. And what I'll say is, I really like to focus 100% of my time, effort, energy on exactly what's needed at that moment. When when students come to a class, that that group of students has needs and. The fact is, is that people learn best by doing. So I want to get the class to doing as quickly as I can because that's where the majority of the learning is going to take place. Where lecture tends to fit in with my coursework in 2014, and of course this may change in 2015 or 2024 or in the future, but where lecture fits in with me is working to help students to understand why I might be asking them to do something on the square range that seems counterintuitive from a, let's say, a speed standpoint or a standing here in front of the target, boy, I think there's a better way we could do this, Paul. Maybe there's, there's a reason why 
uh, maybe our body's natural reaction, maybe the context of some kind of a life-threatening situation that students need to make connections with, oh, I understand why you want me to remediate a malfunction in this way, because my body is going to react in this way, which may make it difficult for me to do it the way that I can do it right here, right now. It's no problem to do it the fastest way, the, the easiest way right here, but oh, you're telling me my body changes when someone's trying to kill me? There's there's chemical dumps that happen in the brain, changes in vision, changes in uh, blood flow in the body. Oh, those make a difference, and so we should take those into account. And that's the biggest place that lecture fits in in what it is that I teach is helping students to understand, okay, here's why we're going to execute this in this fashion. And, and some people tend to be a little bit more visual than than, you know, having something written on a board in front of them and actually seeing you, you know, open up a revolver and empty it and speed, you know, use the speed loader, that is more illustrative to them and they kind of get it a little bit better sometimes as opposed to other people who, you know, can read something and understand exactly how it's done and, and then implement it in real life. Well, and I, and I agree with that, uh, Ryan, but I will say that we get into these learning models, and my background is as a professional teacher. You know, I, I spent, uh, you know, a decade and a half almost in, in schools teaching math and science, and the fact of the matter is, is although some people might learn better by, you know, doing visual things or by reading or by hearing, you know, we've got all these different learning models, the fact of the matter is, is virtually everyone learns better by doing and, and so we want to get students, I mean, shooting a gun, defending ourselves is primarily a physical activity with some, some cognition and, as, as Grant would say, some data collection or some, some real serious information gathering that needs to pl take place throughout. And that's what we need to do to get good at it. And so if we need to explain that in different ways for people to understand it, cool, we can do that. But when it comes down to really learning it, we really need to get out there and do it. Yeah, I'll, I'll go uh, even a little further than Paul did in that. The, the whole idea, one of, one of the things that, I'm, and I'm not a professional educator. I don't consider myself a pro professional educator. I consider myself a, 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 a very searching amateur. Um, but the, uh, over the years, the, the idea of learning modalities, the, you know, the kinesthetic learner, the visual learner, the audit, Tory learner um, has been a big, big part of a lot of people's teaching styles, and we're discovering, oh, guess what? When we do properly randomized trials, teaching trials, we discover that that's just not true anymore, um, and if it, it or it's just not true at all. But what does uh, what is consistent, and Paul hit on it, is the fact that people learn by doing. Um, I took an interesting course in um, creative learning from MIT here. Uh, oh, about a year and a half ago, I guess now. And one of the takeaways from that was very consistently, listen, the only way people actually learn to learn anything is actually to do it rather than reading about it or rather than listening to lecture or, or anything else. And so I'm very much with Paul. Get them out there and start them doing it and get the learning started. There's, there's sometimes, I think, a little bit of in, inertia that has to be overcome in the learning process. And that's one of the things that, that has been on my mind lately is let's get the students out there, let's get them learning, let's get them doing things and get them involved in it. Then they'll learn. And that's that's the big takeaway, and that's one of the things that I that I learned from this MRT course is get students involved. Well, and a lot of uh, a lot of people, you know, you can notice that there's a big difference between the old style of training, um, you know, from the the 70s and the 80s, and what's going on now today. And you kind of see that happening, you know, with the advent of gun culture 2.0, as Michael Bain calls it. You know, these people who are wanting to see, you know, they're the YouTube generation. They want to see things demonstrated. They don't want to sit there and, and read a book for six hours or sit in a class for six hours. By seeing you guys do something like that, they actually understand it a lot more at its base level and then can build their own personal skills upon that. But, well, but watching me as an instructor do it is it, it really pales in comparison to them getting out there and doing it. Right. Yeah, I'm glad Paul. I'm glad Paul mentioned. That. I was about to mention virtually the same thing. the 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 trouble with that is that we very often come up with the idea that the instructor needs to become a demonstrator and demonstrate everything in front of students, and that just 
that just isn't the case. The, the, if you can explain to the student what they're going to do, the reasons behind it, the benefits of it, and then have them do it, it's more efficient from the standpoint of learning than it is from uh, than it is to have the instructor taking up class time doing these demos, which really doesn't benefit the student greatly at all. Now, in terms, one thing I've heard a lot of people talk about, and and I've heard this a lot, is uh, I just don't see the value in paying for training. How do you how do you overcome that sort of mindset as a trainer yourself? Well, the well, you know that it has. Like so many other things, there is a basis in reality for that statement because, and I've said this many a time, and uh, uh, my friend Claude Warner, who is also a well-known instructor, is, has said it a little differently, but all over, all over this country, every day of, of the year, people successfully defend themselves with guns having had no prior training whatsoever. And that is just a fact of life. And we can't say, oh, oh my God, you absolutely need training or you're going to die because you won't, you won't know what to do. Um, and there, has been, there have been quite a few people in this industry who have, who have taken that sort of hyperbolic approach to, to selling their training. You just won't survive. You see it on Facebook. Uh, I see ads on Facebook all the time. If you don't know these three things, you will fail in your first gunfight. And that's just not true. So we first have to acknowledge that if we're going to be honest with the students and honest with our prospective students. Yes, people every day do successfully defend themselves with guns having never had training. However, when we look at what they do and, and, and how they do it and the things that happen, we also discover that in a lot of those cases, those people are injured or the people around them are injured, sometimes unfortunately killed, even though they successfully defended themselves, i.e. the bad guy stopped whatever he was doing. But, may, but in a lot of cases, he didn't stop doing it very quickly because the, the, the person wasn't a good shot, wasn't able to land their rounds on target, or because they didn't understand how their body reacted to the threat and, and, and the conflicting signals that they got. They didn't understand what to do, so they had to improvise a response. And so what I tell people is that, yes, you, I mean, certainly people all the time defend themselves without training. However, you will be more efficient you will expose yourself to less danger. You will expose your loved ones and the people around you to less danger for a shorter period of time if you go out and you get the training and you understand what to do to make a more efficient response. And this goes beyond, of course, we the safety is, is, of course, a skill that needs to be learned, all that other stuff, which is an important part of training too. But in terms of the, the just the defensive shooting part of it, Training makes you more efficient, uh, makes it less likely that you're going to be injured or possibly killed by that bad guy because you didn't know what to do or because you improvised a response that was slower than it would have been otherwise. Yeah, I agree with, with Grant's sentiment here, and I'll add to that this concept that I think is very important for people to understand, and and this is something that Grant and I have talked about a, a quite a bit recently, and the fact that we, we simply can't look at things from one aspect and have a full understanding, and I don't care whether we're talking about firearm selection or caliber choice or, you know, shooting style or shooting stance, the list goes on and on and on. When we think about safety, we have to think about benefits and rewards, uh, risks, excuse me, and, and most importantly, we need to also factor in the severity of the consequences of what it is that could happen. And when people tell me that they don't need training, um, my question to them is, is it really worth the possible consequences not to have that training? You may never need it. You may, if you do need to use your firearm, be able to successfully defend yourself, as, as Grant pointed out. But the big question to me is, is it worth the risk of death of yourself, severe injury to yourself, or death and severe injury of someone that you love to not have that training? The, the consequences of that are tremendously deep and tremendously devastating. As a result, training becomes more important. Because I don't want 
myself to be injured or killed because I don't want my loved ones to be injured or killed. I want to take the extra precaution and do what it is that I need to do to make sure that I have the most chance of prevailing. Um, I, have either of you gentlemen been in an automobile accident this week? Nope. <laughs> you know, I have not, Paul. I, I'm glad to hear that. My question to you is, did you wear your seatbelt this week? Yes, oh, I did. Are you planning on an automobile accident next week? Nope. <laughs> will well, will you... Know, you I don't think so, Paul. Yeah, right. Will you wear your seatbelt? And and this is the the same example. The consequences of this happening, of being involved in an automobile accident, are significant enough that we wear a seatbelt. It's that you know, simple. One of the analogies that I use with people is again going back to that fire extinguisher uh, analogy, is that. If you've ever read the the instructions on a fire extinguisher, and and find out how to use it, it's it's very different than what most people do with it. And the instructions are, of course, uh, aim the stream of whatever fire retardant chemicals there at the base of the flames to to put them out. Most people tend to to spray it, you know, uh, at the flame itself. Mm -hmm. And certainly, you can probably put out a fire that way, but you're going to stand a much better chance of doing it far more efficiently and not running out of that that fire retardant chemical by doing it the way that the training, which is the instructions on the, on the canister itself, tell you to do. And that's the analogy that I very often use, and I think a lot of people will get that. I like the, the seatbelt one, too. That's good. Well, and a lot of people don't understand the, uh, the concept of the subconscious taking over, you know, you read a lot of the the shooting accounts, like from Jim Cirillo and stuff, and he talks about not even realizing that realizing that it was him that was shooting, and and his training just took over when he was presented with that threat. And that's the thing, you know, it's not going to be something that you're like, oh, okay, so this is happening in front of me, so I need to draw, I need to do this, and I need to have it at retention, and then extend and press. It's going to be fast, and by training and 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 re repetition you're going to eventually have that so ingrained that you'll just do it without thinking when it comes that time. And, and that's important. And, and what a lot of people are thinking in their heads right now that, that have some understanding might be thinking about a concept that some people call muscle memory. And, and we've gone much beyond that little idea there into the myelinization and how it is that our brain helps to train actions and and become familiar and very proficient with things and that's one of the opportunities that good quality training provides is the opportunity to help and give our body experience in the actions that we'll need to take so that they happen uh, much more fluidly and, and as a word that's been used here multiple times tonight much more efficiently and when it comes to violence we need to be as efficient as we can uh, the longer violence continues, the much more likely we are to suffer the consequences of violence, which, as I've mentioned, are severe injury, death. Don't forget about the civil and possibly criminal issues that may ensue. Um, and so we need to end this quickly. That's what efficiency is about. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in terms of like the training techniques and methods, I know the, the course that you just recently did, Grant, was uh, Defensive Revolver Fundamentals. And do a lot of the training techniques or methods cross over to several different disciplines, or do you have to tailor a lot of the training to the specific platform you're instructing on? The the, the problem that you run into sometimes when changing the the, the hardware, uh, the, the software is, is always the same. Of course, we we all ha we have the same um, natural threat reactions. Uh, we all of that remains the same, but the, sometimes the manipulation of the hardware itself becomes important and is certainly different between um, between various types of guns. And I I'm famous for saying that that when I'm teaching a revolver class, that I'm not teaching warmed over autoloader techniques. And the reason I say that is because if, uh, for instance, uh, the, the most egregious example is uh, in the in the auto loader world, a lot of people teach a tactical reload, right? Where you where you take the partially extended magazine out and you and you put a fresh one in, and and there are 15 different ways to do it, and everybody's got their own favorite way of how to do a tactical reload. 
it, it really is, uh, it's a silly enough thing to be teaching to autoloaders, and it's not something that I teach. It's, it's just kind of kind of silly. But it becomes particularly silly when you talk to these same people who say, okay, so for the, for the revolver shooters, what you're going to do is you're going to open up your cylinder, you're going to press the ejector rod halfway, which will push the expended uh, uh, cases out, and then when you release that ejector rod, the, the unexpended rounds are going to drop back in the cylinder, leaving the brass that has been shot standing up. You can then pick those things out and then retrieve some loose rounds from your pocket and put those loose rounds into the cylinder, into those holes that you have just vacated. And the the idea that you would even that you would even think of doing such a thing is absolutely ludicrous. And yet there's this idea that because we do a tactical reload in the auto loader world, we must have to do it in the revolver world as well. And there are lots of other things like that, some of them big, some of them small, where people try to adapt specific techniques from not just other platforms, sometimes other contexts as well to make them fit. So, yeah, the, the, there has to be a change. There's a, a big change in, for instance, if you're teaching um, someone how to shoot a traditional double-action, single-action autoloader, there's a, there's a change in how you teach that versus how you might ch ch teach something else. So, yeah, those things do change from platform to platform, and, and they have to if you're going to if you're going to seek out the most efficient ways of doing something with any given platform, they have to change. At the same time, uh, I think that there are some things that we can maintain consistency. And uh, examples might be stance or tactics or um, ways that we process information, um, maybe presentation from the holster. You know, when we look at uh, dealing with a, a rifle compared to a handgun, there are a lot of things that change, but there are some things uh, that we do to mitigate recoil in both the handgun and the rifle that are the same. And those things are consistent. And whenever I can find consistency that makes sense to take from one discipline to the other, I, I want to have that consistency because consistency is one of those tools that we can use to help be more efficient. And so if we do things in the same order, the same manner, the same place from platform to platform when it makes sense, that's going to reduce the number of skills that we need to learn in totality, therefore making it more efficient for us to be able to accomplish our goals. And, and so, as Grant is exactly right, obviously, if I carry a Glock, I'm not going to worry about the manual safety on the Glock because there is no manual safety on that Glock pistol. However, if an AR-15 is part of my home defense plan, I certainly better understand the application of that manual safety and, and when to use it and how to use it, and so that doesn't cross over. But mitigating the recoil of those two firearms has a lot of common points. You know, making sure that our torso is, is forward, that uh, you know, we're, we're in a stance that allows us to dynamically absorb what it is that that handgun or rifle is doing to be able to make quick follow-up shots. Well, and I can see um, like potential problems also with with kind of trying to make those different techniques cross over, like Grant was saying with the tactical reload on the semi-auto sure. and then the one with the revolver. You know, I'm think Grant's describing you know pushing the ejector rod halfway out, and I can just see a case slipping out from under the extractor star and getting caught and having a rim caught underneath it, and then you now have a disabled gun because you were trying. Absolutely, to yeah, probably you shouldn't. Know, have. It, it you know this this thing requires a very deep understanding from the instructor not and not just a physical understanding but a conceptual and philosophical understanding as well. Uh, for instance, one of the things that very often comes out when we're teaching long guns and we're teaching shooting around obstacles or barricades as as some people call them. And for instance, if you if you're if you're a right-handed rifle shooter, which I am, and you need to shoot around from the left side of the barricade and still maintain some some the, the best amount of cover that you can, you have to switch hands, you have to switch the shoulders on the rifle. There's just there's no other way to do it. And the trouble is is that if someone doesn't understand these ideas and these concepts, what will happen is they'll try to teach the same thing with a handgun. Okay, so because we switched hands 
with the rifle, we now need to switch hands with our handgun as well as we shoot around the left side of cover. And when you demo this for people and show them, you know, there's there's no difference because both hands are still meeting at the same point. It doesn't matter which one's on top. Um, it, it just it doesn't affect how you shoot around cover at all. But if you don't understand that and you don't actually try it, you the, the you'll end up teaching people to switch their hands with the handgun as they switch around cover, which is what unfortunately in this business uh, I would say probably a majority of people do. So it's incumbent upon the instructor to understand this and and, and question it at a very deep level and and always question the assumptions behind what they're doing and why. Now, in terms of maximizing the value of the training, how can an, an, an instructor maximize the value of the training, especially with the current up and down like ammunition shortages we seem to be experiencing? That's a really good question, Ryan. Uh, I think the, the most important thing that an instructor needs to do, and students need to demand of their instructors, is to have a purpose for each and every drill that is taught on the range. Um, you know, when we have a training course, we don't shoot for the sake of shooting. We shoot because we want to learn and understand something about defensive concepts. And instructors need to remember that there there must be a purpose, a goal, an objective of every time we go out there to press the trigger. And we need to make sure we tie that in. And so that, that's going to make our training much more efficient if we just stop shooting for the sake of shooting, which i got to tell you is a heck of a lot of fun. And if the ammunition is there, it's great. But when the ammunition isn't, it doesn't make sense. You know, one of the things that uh, I, I'll agree with that, and one of the things that as an instructor I, I spend a lot of time doing is thinking, okay, where do I want the students to go from here? Mm-hmm. What you know are do, the skill that we're working on now? Have they absorbed it? Have they gotten enough reps to to start to to actually integrate that into their being, if you if you if you will? And thinking ahead, okay, what do I need to teach next? What drill do I need to do? Um, uh, who's going to benefit from it? Some students will, some students won't. Who's getting fatigued and won't and won't get any benefit? Do we need to, to stop and all that sort of thing? And it's a lot of work. It's it's very fatiguing from an instructional standpoint to do that. And yet, to maximize the value of the train to the students, you have to. You have to think in terms of what is their fatigue level and what are they really learning from this and who's learning what. Um, in this class that we that uh, that Paul was in, I had one student that I really wanted to emphasize a specific thing that he had brought up. The, the, the first morning during the, the, the morning lecture. Paul remembers this. And there was a student that, that, uh, that brought up this question, and I said, don't worry, we'll get to it, trust me. And so I, I think it was actually the next day that, that I finally got around to it, and I had given the guy an answer. Paul had even reiterated the answer. And this guy uh, wasn't wasn't quite internalizing this and so I set up a drill and in the middle of this drill I did something specifically for him to illustrate to him what we were trying to get across and it finally clicked but I waited I set that up and I waited because I knew I could do it at a certain point but I had to get the students to that point first before I could set that up and then even during that drill I needed to set it up in a specific way so it would benefit primarily him um, and so, on an individual student basis, you, you have to be thinking of these things. And the good thing is that when you do, everybody else gets the lesson, too. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so, by, by thinking in terms of, okay, what am I going to do for, these, for the students, and maybe even a specific student that everybody else is going to get benefit from as well. And if you, I think the hardest thing is that if you think you can go out as an instructor and just run a whole bunch of canned drills, and at the end of this sort of sequence of canned drills, you you spit out a, a, a properly trained shooter, which is what a lot of people do, um, that's not maximizing the value of training. It, it, the, the instructor has to be thinking constantly about what he's going to do and when he's going to do it and the lessons that he wants the students to absorb. And and no two classes are identical. You know, I, no. I often uh, I often compare this to being a good physician. 
um, which might be a little bit arrogant of me to you know put defensive training into that uh, realm. But the fact of the matter is, if every doctor's answer to every situation was, well, take two aspirin and call me in the morning, we wouldn't have a very efficient medical system. And my job as a trainer is to look at the students that I have in class and determine what it is that they need the most. And I call my courses critical defensive handgun or critical defensive shotgun, critical defensive rifle. I do that for a reason because I need to teach the students what is most important for them right then and there. And class on uh, you know July 16th of this month uh, is going to be different from August 23rd and 24th of next month. It just is because I'm going to have a different group of students. Yep. Well, and you think about the different experiences that both of you guys have. I mean, you know, Grant, you're known as having a lot of experience with how to run a revolver as efficiently as possible. And, Paul, you're known a lot more for semi-automatic pistols and, and locks and stuff like that. So, you know, yes, Paul, if someone showed up at a class with a revolver, you could probably teach them how to use it pretty efficiently. But, you know, that's that whole specialization thing, like you had the analogy with uh, with the medical system. You know, we wouldn't have a bunch of specialists if every doctor knew everything there is to know. Great example, Ryan, and that's that's exactly right. Uh, you know, in a pinch, um, absolutely, I can get people to where they need to be with a revolver. But I know somebody that can get them there faster, get them there, get them there more efficiently. When I have the opportunity, I want to take advantage of that, and that's exactly why I hosted Grant. The and and that's true with with uh, a lot of other things in this business too for instance I don't I don't talk about the the legalities and and ethics of, of defensive gun use because that's not my area of specialty so when I need students to understand that I tell them you know what you need to do you need to call up Masada you and you need to go take his mag 20 class that's what you need to do uh, I can answer some questions certainly because I do have a knowledge of that but uh, I'm going to refer them to a specialist to do that, and uh, and Paul has hosted Ma um, uh, the Mag 20 class up at Safety mm -hmm. Solutions Academy for the same reason. Now, now, sort of moving into the trainee perspective, because it's very important to understand. Um, you know, we've kind of talked about the instructor perspective, but as the person going to a class, and Paul, you said you were a part of the class that Grant held here. Having an open mind as a trainee is definitely one of the most important things when attending a course, but what other things are really important to keep in mind when you're attending a course as the trainee? I think I think one of, obviously an open mind is incredibly important because you never know what you're going to stumble on and you want to be uh, cognizant of learning opportunities when they arise, even if they might not be what it is you expected. But when you go to a class, if you want to have a successful class, you need to have a set of objectives as a learner for what it is that you want to get out of that class. Quality instructors, within reason, I mean, if you show up at one of my critical defensive handgun classes and want to learn how to run your rifle better, you've probably made a mistake. However, if there are some specific things that you're struggling with with relation to a handgun, maybe it's carry position, maybe it's uh, making precision shots. You should have a tick list of what it is that you want to gain from that class and you want to have the the confidence to say to the instructor, hey just so you know this is this is what I'd like to get out of class. Maybe even ahead of time you shoot that instructor an email or you set up a phone conversation or you do something that allows you to communicate with that instructor so that you can set some realistic objectives to make progress. It is not inexpensive to attend a training course. Even if that training course is in your hometown, you've got tuition to class, you've got gas money, you've got you know setting up uh, beverages and food to get you through the course, you've got your ammunition involved, range fees, the time, which is one of the most uh, valuable assets that you give up when you go to a training course um, or invest when you go to a training course. Make sure that you know what it is you want out of that course and that it's the right course to get you that. I would I would echo the the last part of 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 Paul's statement and by saying that I think the the most important thing as a trainee that you do is before you even book the course and and what I mean by that is being honest with yourself about the things that you need to learn and about the things that whatever instructor you're considering is capable of teaching you for instance if you're if your goal is to learn how to keep yourself and your family safe against a violent criminal attack 
maybe you shouldn't be going to yet another special forces weekend where you learn to shoot tangos in a shoot house, right? You know, or go down a three-story tower taking out bad guys on your way down. I think being honest with yourself about what you need need to learn and then making your decision about where, what class you're going to take and who you're going to train with and all that other stuff based upon what you really need to do in your life. I think that's the most important thing. Now, if your goal is to, hey, I just want to go and burn some ammo and have fun, okay, great. You know, have Enjoy yourself. Anything, you can do that any, any one of a number of different ways. But if your goal is actually get training, training for something that you might actually use, I think you have to be honest about where you are, about where you want to go, and look at who can get you there v without w without being affected by the hyperbole and all that other stuff that's typically used to sell courses. Well, and a good analogy might be like you know me bringing to you a, a 1911 Grant that I want for you know as a race gun. You know your specialty is is revolvers, Rugers, and stuff, and so you know that may, I mean you, I'm sure you could make an amazing race gun. Don't get me wrong, Grant, but you know, you have different people who have different specialties, and and going to a guy who does competition guns with a concealed carry gun request might not be the same thing. You know, especially, exactly. and then you can kind of translate that to the training world. Exactly. So, um, what sorts of things should a trainee look for when choosing an instructor? I mean, that's that's really important because there are a lot of people out there who purport to be instructors and may not be the best ones in the world. So what sorts of things should they look for? Hmm. That's, a, that's a good question. Um, I, think that, I think that we tie in a lot of the concepts that we've been talking about throughout the, the podcast here in this question. And, you know, no one understand that uh, as much as I know and trust Grant Cunningham today in 2014, um, in, in 2009, um, I didn't have that same relationship, and I, I took a lot of time to look and research and understand what it is that Grant offered my customers, my clients, my students, uh, before I decided to bring Grant to Safety Solutions Academy. And and what I looked for was number one, a context that made sense for my students. I looked for someone that was going to help to shore up areas that I wasn't as knowledgeable as some of my students might like. And again, I can get people through with revolvers, but it's just not my specialty. So I bring in the specialist to handle that. So that's one thing. Look for the specialist in what it is that you want to learn about. And, and then I would look towards people that are uh, professional and reputable in the industry. Um, with the internet, uh, there's this cool thing, and I don't know, it's a fairly new website out there. It's called the Googles, I think is what it's Ooh. called. And, you know, I can, I can type in just about anything and get lots of information spit right back at me. And when you're going to invest, you know, two days plus travel plus ammunition plus money, it makes sense to do some investing, excuse me, investigating of who it is that you think you might want to do that with. Um, you know, Grant's an author. That means that publishers trust him. Um, he writes for other publications. He has a blog. I can go to his blog and I can consume information there. I can read reviews of his courses online. And so those are the things that people should be looking for in 2014 is information ahead of time to make sure that they're dealing with a professional. That's more important than a certificate from some organization. Um, the quality people uh, echoing the idea that this is a, a professional individual, that's what it is that I want to look for. I think that I go back whenever whenever this question comes up, I go back to that word that I like to use so much, and that is context. Mm -hmm. And I ask myself, what context is this guy coming from? And he may have been uh, a decorated SWAT officer or, or a decorated soldier or Marine um, or, an Air, or an Air Force uh, pararescue jumper, whatever that is. And I ask myself, okay, what context is this, where, what context does this fellow come from or this woman come from for that matter? Does this context fit mine? Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have a, a, a police officer who's really good at being a police officer who also understands the context of private sector defensive shooting and can sort of switch gears and teach you the stuff that you need to know as a, a private citizen 
or that the that the that the marine, the decorated marine, can't switch hats and understand what it is that you need in, when you're you know when you're in the Walmart. That certain they certainly can, but I think that that by and large, when you look at these the the instructor and they're selling courses based upon their credentials as, as somebody in the military or somebody in law enforcement or, or, or a competition shooter and those are the credentials that you're using to sell a course, you probably have to ask yourself, does, does this really fit the context of use that I need? And I think whenever you see those cross-context sort of classes, uh, they, for instance, I'm a defensive shooting instructor. I, I don't think I can teach a, a law enforcement class, and I really don't think that I can teach a competition class because my context of use is different. There are some things, of course, some specific mechanical things that, yeah, I could probably teach, but overall, if I'm teaching private sector defensive handgunning, I'm probably not going to be really good at teaching that other stuff. And so that idea of context goes both ways. And so I tell people, look at the in, instructor's background and where he or she is coming from and ask yourself, does this match the context that I expect to use it in? And if it does, great. Go take the class. If it doesn't, you probably need to keep searching. Well, in terms of looking for different types of training, too, uh, are there any types of training that people should avoid uh, for instance, situations where the risks of the training outweigh any perceived benefits. Yeah, I think so. There, uh, there are. I think some. Uh, how, boy, how am I going to say this without? <laughs> Paul knows where. Paul knows where I'm going. You're not um, Grant, so go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, there are some trainers and some schools and some classes out. There that pride themselves on this on, on sort of this macho big boy rules things, and I, I think if you hear big boy rules, that's probably a red flag. You probably need to question that a little bit. But uh, you know, when when you're doing things like um, if you're throwing five people together who've never trained before, and you're going to put them in as a team into a shoot house with live guns shooting tango targets all over the place, um, I think that the benefits of that training um, do do not exceed the risks involved. The risks are just too high. When you're doing things like, okay, we're going to do this drill where you're going to stand downrange and have somebody, somebody shoot at the target next to you. Um, and, and I think that's an obvious example where there's just no benefit but all kinds of risks. So yeah, there is, uh, there is a lot of training out there. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of people brag about going through a lot of this training because it's exciting and it, you know, like I said, it's it's macho and and gives you all kinds of of, uh, of testosterone points for doing it, and I think you really have to look at that with a jaundiced eye and say, you know, there there is no benefit to me here, and there therefore I'm not going to take the risk, and w without going into detail, uh, it's very easy to find out. The, these kinds of courses that are all over out there. And I think that's a good example of uh, the, the, the kind of training that people should avoid. I agree. I, I also would say that uh, we need to avoid training um, where instructors aren't ready to answer the question of why. Mm -hmm. um, th there is risk in everything that we do. You know, we've got some severe, severe weather, excuse me, here in the Cleveland area tonight, and, you know, here I am hooked up to electronics and, and having this conversation. There's risk involved in that. Um, I, I have to evaluate what those risks are and make a decision for myself. Um, if you're not able to get the understanding of why you're doing what you're doing from an instructor, you're probably in the wrong place. That's probably training that you should avoid. And especially when you get to that point in training where, you, you hear that little ding, ding, ding going off in your head, and you're thinking to yourself, this does not seem right. Boy, this makes me nervous. <laughs> and, if, and if the instructor isn't absolutely 100% willing to put the brakes on immediately and address that lack of, of emotional comfort with, with what's about to happen or what is happening, you're in the wrong place. Because that, that emotional uh, concern can become a, a safety issue in and of itself. And so those are situations where you need to have an instructor that's ready to delve deeply into why and is able to 
help you understand why the risks that you're about to take are going to provide a real benefit to you. And if you know, that's not able to happen, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with putting putting your firearm in the gun bag and going home. And I, I think Paul uh, Paul said this earlier. There is this you know wonderful new thing called Google out there, mm -hmm. and you can find out where these things happen before you plunk down your hard-earned money. Well, and one thing I was noticing as well, um, it kind of brings me back to that, uh, I believe Larry Vickers posted it a while ago on YouTube, and there was a video of uh, some Spetsnaz officers doing training that they do over in Russia, and he gave a disclaimer at the beginning of it, please do not ever attempt this, this is Russia, we're in a different country, and this is how they do things over here, but if you ever see something like that, that's probably a training you should avoid. Well, and, and if you think about the context of, you know, what Russian Spetsnaz does or American Special Forces, you know, these are people that have a much, much, much higher likelihood of using the skills that they are training than you and I do. And the consequences of those skills are elevated because they are in situations where um, medical care may be distant uh, and, and from a time and a, a location standpoint, um, the severity of injuries can be very severe. In that kind of a situation, the benefits of training and, and taking risks in training may outweigh the fact that, that people could get hurt in training. And people die in military training all the time. Mm -hmm. We're looking at a, a different equation here. We, I am not a military operator. I mean, I was in the teams and everything, but I mean, it was a softball team. It's different, <laughs> right? You know, I, I don't have to take those kinds of risks in my life, and so I don't. Um, I, I have to balance it for me and my family and what's best for us. Again, that, that, that word context comes back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in that, and you got to think about also, you know, yes, you have the basis of the, the firearms training you have, but you got to think about... If you're going to be involved in a defensive encounter, you know, maybe you're in a parking garage. What is that concussive force from that, that shot that you fire going to do to your hearing, your vision, you know, your other faculties to allow you to assess if there are any other threats around? So you have to be aware of what other physical things are going to happen besides adrenaline and tunnel vision and stuff that sure. you hear about all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. But, you know, you kind of bring up a, a really important point there, Ryan, in the sense that, there are some people that think that, hey, we should head out to the range, and since you're not going to have hearing protection on, you know, in a in a defensive shooting, we should probably do some shooting without that hearing protection. My ears don't get stronger or better at deflecting sound by shooting without <laughs> my hearing protection on. It's just, you know, we know that every time you fire that gun, there is going to be damage to your ears. That That is guaranteed risk for very little benefit, in if any at all. Act. In a defensive encounter, that risk uh, does not outweigh the benefits. Exactly. Yeah, right. right. That's a good example. Dead people have poor hearing. End of story. <laughs> so uh, sort of our final question here, and then we'll start wrapping up the main topic. As the person spending the hard-earned money on training, what sorts of things would you like to see more of in the courses that are offered around the country? One word, reality. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd have to. I'm going in the same direction as Paul. I'd have to say the same thing. I think uh, that we do do need more reality in our training. And and I sometimes I talk about the difference between reality and authenticity. Um, we need more reality. That doesn't mean we need more authenticity. And what I mean by that is that you can certainly put together on any given range a a living room or a bedroom that is looks very much like a living room or a bedroom with lamps and, and end tables and pictures on the wall and, and rugs and, and vases on the table. You can certainly do that. But that doesn't mean it's reality. If, if the bedroom doesn't look like your bedroom and isn't laid out like your bedroom, then it's not real. In, in terms of the in terms of how you're going to use the skills that you're going to be developing there, it it may be authentic in the sense that yeah it looks like a room uh, that that could be in somebody's house but it's not in my house it's not real to me. Um, you can have reality without authenticity and you can have authenticity without reality, and I do think we need more reality, and that is. Um, how do what are the the, the precursors to the incident happening? Uh, how do we deal with the incident as it in, unfolds? What do we do afterwards? All of these things can become very real, and we talk a lot about 
um, the use of force on force and simunitions and all that sort of thing to make our training real, to make the conditions under which we're going to use the skills um, more realistic. And that's where I'm going these days to hopefully bring more realism to what it is I do. And it's a very, very difficult thing to do. Luckily, um, some of the leaders in the industry, uh, and one of them is Ken Murray, who wrote the the groundbreaking books, Training at the Speed of Life, uh, who has started the Reality-Based Training Association. So I'm hoping we'll see a lot more reality coming to our training in the next few years. Well, in, in speaking about sort of like the bedroom situation there, like you said, Grant, there are just some things that you can't capture in terms of reality, like that that groggy feeling, that that un you know unoriented feeling when you wake up, when you first wake up and you're confused, like okay, where am I? Sometimes, you know, you're not going to be able to capture that in a training setting, so you do have to prepare the student for that, but you may not capture that in in its full entirety. Uh, that last part that you just said, I'll agree with Ryan. And, um, you know, I would encourage you at some point in time to get together with Grant or get together with myself, and I would imagine that at some point in time during class, we're going to have you pretty well fogged over, pretty well confused, pretty well um, in a state that may have some similar uh, impacts as waking up in the middle of the night and having to deal with the situation. Yeah, I, I'm glad Paul jumped in with that because you can... The, I, there's a level of abstraction that you can get to in training, and there's a level of abstraction that you cannot get to. Sure. Um, we can simulate certain things, we can abstract certain things, and allow you to see the effects of them, even though you're not experiencing the actual symptom. So you do you have to understand the abstraction and the and the difference between the um, between the symptom and the result. Um, and this again, this is this is the hardest part of of being a teacher is how to get students to experience the result, if not the symptom. So, are there any final thoughts from you guys before we wrap up the main topic in terms of uh, getting the most from your training and uh, also picking the right instructor? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> if you look, Ryan, and I, I'm not looking at the ticker and how long we've been at it, but you know this is this has been an in-depth show, and the fact of the matter is is that part of this is uh, a trial and error opportunity and or trial and error situation, and I would encourage people to start diving in, do the research, do the the looking around, um, find quality people, and then get out there and train, and revise your plan and go at it again. And that's really what it is that people need to do because, you know, we can learn something from every situation. And it may be, oh, I need to watch out for this next time. And those are hard lessons, but sometimes they're some of the most important lessons that we need. So don't be afraid to get out there and train. Don't be afraid to hold your instructors to a very high standard before, during, and after your courses. You're investing your money. You're investing your time, your energy. Hold them accountable. I think that the the last thing I will leave people with is one of the things that you should use to vet your instructor is to ask him or her what what have you changed your mind about in the last year what do you teach today that you don't teach then uh, what do you do you not teach today that you did then and you should expect an answer. And, and a specific answer. Uh, and I, I remember somebody being asked this question once and saying, oh gosh, you know, the world is always in flux and things are changing all the time and I've committed myself to be uh, on top of the changing dynamics of, of defensive shooting. And, and that's a non sexical answer. That's a politician answer. What you should expect your instructor to say is, you know, I've changed my mind about this specific thing. I don't teach this anymore. I do teach this now um, that I didn't. And they should have specific answers. If they're if they're giving you the the nonsensical answer, maybe you should rethink that. But also, if they can't come up with an answer, maybe they're not evolving. Maybe they're not learning, and maybe they're not going to be teaching you the best thing that could be taught today. So I think asking questions of your instructor, yeah, and asking very specific uh, questions of your instructor and expecting answers. Always expect answers. 
Excellent. Well, there's some wonderful discussion tonight, so we're going to wrap up the main topic and head into the obscure gun we want segment and then the wrap-up section. So uh, this is a new segment where we get to pick a gun that is obscure that we want or simply because or simply because we want it or a gun that isn't made that we want to see made. Uh, money is no object and it's purely a thought exercise, so have fun with it. Um, so I'll start off with mine and then we'll have Grant and Paul. Uh, I started off, I'm still waiting for Ruger to make me an LCP and 22 long rifle. Why, Ryan? I, I'd like to know. Maybe that's not part of the segment, but I'm interested. Basically because every single 22 pistol, with the exception of a few choice examples, in that, that size category, like the Jennings and the Bryco and stuff, have just been utter crap. And I would assume that Ruger could take the time and figure out how to make a pistol that size in 22 long rifle. They, made, they did great with their SR-22. I've been very impressed with that. So I would love to see something like the LCP in 22 long rifle. Well, I, I know that Claude Werner would agree with you. I think he'd like to see that. Um, Claude's a big fan of, of small twenty two pistols. Um, hmm. Boy, um, that's a God, that's a toughie. Let me because, give you, I bet you yeah, the Benelli, Benelli, right? Um, you know, a Benelli B76 would be really cool. Um, I, uh, I think right now, if I were to pick something that I would just love to have that I don't have, um, I would like to have a real honest-to-goodness biathlon rifle. You know, with the, with the, with the backpack straps and, and all, you know, all the goodies with it, that's what I'd like to have. It's, it's, they're relatively obscure, they're relatively expensive, uh, and unfortunately the, the only supply of reasonably priced ones was just cut off by pres presidential fiat here about a week ago. But um, you know, Onshoot still makes them, and if if money were no object, that's what I would buy. Aren't most I, of those straight pulls? Um, they're usually a toggle action. Toggle uh, action. So you get the the effect of a straight pull, but the toggle action is such that it's it's a very very short throw, and it can be done um, with the trigger finger and the thumb of the firing hand very very rapidly. And they're just a lot of fun. They're very accurate, um, and uh, and I, I don't know why. I was watching biathlon during the Winter Olympics, and I and I just fell in love with that gun, and now I want one. And I I can't even explain why. I just do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, uh, uh, you know what I would really, really, really like to see is uh, something that that I don't understand why it's not made, but I would love to see a Smith and Wesson Shield with no manual safety. I would just be absolutely thrilled. Uh, Paul. Oh wait, Paul? I'm sorry. Wait, uh, I just newsflash. That's out there. Yeah. I want to see a working R. Nah, we won't go that way either. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I had a great experience out at the range uh, this past week with my six and a half year old daughter. Um, she is an incredibly responsible young girl. Um, you know, I posted a video up on Facebook. I was absolutely thrilled when she picked up her Smith and Wesson. Uh, AR-22 in a low kneeling position, got the rifle shouldered, and just started to slam a 12-inch piece of steel at about 10 yards, just over and over and over again. So I want a Smith & Wesson AR-22 that is integrally suppressed. I want a suppressor <laughs> built into that rifle so that my daughter can uh, can shoot that thing all day long with uh, without having to wear her ear protection. Um, I think that would be fabulous, and I'm actually going to see if I can can have this done. I, I I haven't yet taken the gun apart to see what's going on there, but I think this is a possibility. <laughs> Those integrally suppressed guns are amazing. I know uh, I've worked with suppressors, um, you know, the screw-on type, the ones that everybody mm -hmm. has. But then uh, I just posted a video on my YouTube channel of me shooting my buddy's MP5 SD, mm -hmm. and the difference is just it, it's crazy. It's that I don't know if it if it's just more efficient and it captures more of the gases, but I know that the suppressor, the barrel cuts off. If you take the suppressor off, the barrel cuts off way inside the handguard. Mm -hmm. But if you actually have the suppressor on, it goes out past the handguard. So I don't know if that extra length helps or. 
Well, it's you know, it's there are some challenges with guns that have integral suppressors or suppressors that are built into the barrel that are that are not detachable. But some of those things are starting to be worked out. You know, I'm working locally with a company, uh, Great Lakes Tactical, which has a fabulously uh, integrally suppressed Ruger 1022. I mean, the gun literally, especially with subsonic rounds, all you hear are action noises. And when I look at that gun, that's fabulous. Except it's heavy. Um, it's and this is not their fault. I'm just talking about the gun. The manual of arms is awkward, uh, especially for a child. The, the trigger isn't what it is that it should be. And I look at that Smith and Wesson AR-22, and I think to myself, now that would be the perfect IS gun. Single tack stamp. Let's do it. Every six-year-old needs one. <laughs> and that would look pretty cool, I would think, though that integral suppression going onto the rail. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. So we're going to head into the wrap-up section. Don't forget to shop Brownells using our affiliate link, handgunradio.com slash Brownells. Be sure to go like Handgun Radio on Facebook and share it with your friends. And leave us a review on iTunes. It helps the show in the iTunes standings. And also, listen to all the great shows on the Firearms Radio Network, including the brand new Off-Road Podcast. There's a link in the show notes. Be sure to visit the Firearms Insider for reviews and SHOT Show 2014 coverage. And if you're interested in writing reviews for the Firearms Insider, please email tj at tj at firearmsradio.tv. And also be sure to check out the Firearms Radio Network on YouTube. So, uh, Grant, where can people find you? Uh, the best place to get a hold of me is grant at personalsecurity.us. Of course, you can go to my website, personalsecurity.us. And if you're interested in revolvers and, and general gun stuff, uh, you can go to my uh, namesake site, uh, grantcunningham.com. And I am a regular reader of the Grant Cunningham blog, so there are links to both those websites in the show notes. Be sure to check those out. And, uh, Paul, where can people find you? There's uh, really two places I'd love for you to track me down. First of all, safetysolutionsacademy.com is the place to find uh, the blog and all of the training events that we host. Um, in addition to running training on my own, I feel it's really important to give my students the opportunity to experience different instructors, uh, different styles, different genres, and so you know that, that leads to the whole Grant Cunningham idea. So all the information for all those types of courses, the Masada AU group, the Daniel Shaw courses, um, those are all at safetysolutionsacademy.com. So I'd love for you to come out and train with us. Check us out there. And, of course, uh, there is that thing called the Safety Solutions Academy podcast. It's been out there for the past three or four years. We're uh, getting close to episode 350. And so I'd love you to check me out on iTunes. And we're brand new on Stitcher as well. So do a search for us either of those places. We'd love to, to have you check it out. Excellent. And there are both links to that in the show notes as well. So be sure to check those out, handgunradio.com slash 055. So I appreciate you guys both coming on. It was a really great episode. Loved hearing about your different perspectives on the training environment. Thank also, you so much for having us, Ryan. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was a great time, Ryan. Always a pleasure. And all right, until next week, have fun and safe shooting. <laughs>